Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, QBM Tools Network for short, that is co-coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org. Uh, we're very pleased you could be with us today, uh, here with us today. Um, Today we're going to, we have uh, two presenters, uh, Rebecca Clark Uchina and Nick Batista from the Island Institute, and they're going to be speaking about ca on characterizing the lobster fishery for future use in ocean planning. Um, in addition, I'd also like to introduce to, uh, to today's co-moderator uh, Nick Weiner from Open Channels. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca and Nick shortly, but before I do, I wanted to let you guys know to, how to ask questions. Uh, you can type questions into the question panel of the user interface, and then uh, Nick or I, Nick Weiner that is, or I will relay those to the presenters. Now you can go ahead and type questions in at any point during the presentation. We'll hold the substantive questions um, for the end because we'll, we've got um, a portion at the end of the webinars uh, dedicated to question and answer. Um, but if you have just a quick clarifying question, you can go ahead and send that too, and I could uh, ask uh, uh, Rebecca and Nick during their presentation if they could clarify that point. So that would be an example, would be if you needed an acronym defined, et cetera. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to you guys, Rebecca and Nick. Great. Thank you. So hello, I'm Nick Batista. I'm the Marine Programs Director here at the Island Institute, and as Sarah mentioned. Uh, I'm Rebecca. I'm the Marine Programs Associate at the Island Institute. And we're very excited for today's webinar. The Island Institute is located in Rockland, Maine, and we work to sustain Maine's island and remote coastal communities and exchange ideas and experiences to further the sustainability of communities here and elsewhere. What this means for ocean planning purposes is we want communities like Monhegan, which is the community in the picture on your screen, to continue to be supported by nearby ocean space. Access to nearby ocean space is critical for the future of these communities, and we've been working for the last seven years on understanding and helping to translate how important this access is um, to these communities. Uh, when it comes to ocean planning, we've been engaged in, in ocean planning and, and various um, mapping efforts for a little while. Um, we've done anecdotal mapping with lobster, tuna, and other fishermen in Maine. And so the figure or the uh, picture on your left so shows some fishermen gathered around a chart drawing where they fish and where their community fishes. Um, and talking about how they use ocean space. We also helped lead the first fisheries characterization for the Northeast Regional Ocean Council, um, and that helped that work helped develop the uh, vessel monitoring system maps that are part of the data portal. Um, and that's the, the figure on the other side of the screen. That figure shows um, the groundfish fishery in New England from 2006 to 2010 areas in uh, darker red are areas where there is more fishing activity, orange is um, less activity, yellow is, is lower levels, green and, and blue are, are even lower levels. Um, you can see that in New England the groundfish fishery has some spatial management components and that big box in the middle is an area that is close to groundfish fishing or was closed during, during those years. So in New England, we have a draft ocean plan. Here's the table of contents. Now, from my perspective, the plan does a couple of things. It provides context and background about what is happening in the ocean off of New England. It provides best practices for engaging in communities. It suggests some research priorities and generally tries to help federal agencies make better decisions about the ocean. Um, Chapter 3 is really the, the heart of the plan, and Chapter 3 identifies regulatory and management actions, available maps and data, um, and then also has commitments for federal agencies to use the various pieces of information in the plan, in the maps, in the data, in the other information projects. And those commitments end up in 
three buckets. One is um, maintaining and updating the existing data sets. Um, another is informing regulatory and management decisions. And the third is enhancing um, federal agency coordination. It's important to note that in New England, the, the plan is really more of um, an integrated coastal management plan. It doesn't designate specific spaces for specific uses. Um, it's much more about what is happening overall and how do we use that information in decision-making processes. So, uh, as I said before, one key aspect of the plan is the data portal. And so what you're seeing now is the uh, data portal, um, Northeast Ocean data, um, it's available there. It has all kinds of information about various human uses, um, human activities, marine life, environmental characteristics. Um, one of the great things in the plan are some maps of where fishing activity takes place off of New England. So again, this is a vessel monitoring system map of the New England ground fish fishery or the multi-species fishery. Um, that's the cod, haddock, pollock, flounders, um, those sort of species. Other species, monkfish, herring, scallop, surf clam, ocean quahog, squid, mackerel. Um, there are also vessel monitoring system maps of those species. For um, These maps come from the VMS system, which is a, uh, it's a device in, on these fishing boats that sends a ping up to a satellite every 30 minutes or, an hour, or every hour, depending on the fishery. Um, and it, 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 NIMS looks at it, and it, uh, it's used primarily as an enforcement tool. It wasn't really built for ocean planning purposes. But when it comes to looking at the spatial footprint of the fisheries listed here on the screen, it's really helpful to see where things are taking place and where they're not taking place. Just because you don't see fishing activity in a certain place. It may be that um, fishermen weren't allowed to go there that year. It's a closed area. Um, these maps also don't distinguish between transit, um, steaming out to the fishing grounds, and fishing activity. Um, other maps on the, on the data portal do, do look at that issue. Um, these VMS maps really only apply to federal fisheries, fisheries that are regulated by the fisheries management councils. Um, and while these are some of the region's most important fisheries, um, they're not helpful for understanding where tuna fishing activity happens, or where the party charter fleet fishes, um, or where lobster fishing takes place. So um, it's great that we have this data, but it's not a complete look at where fishing activity takes place in New England. For me, the lobster fishery is the backbone of Maine's coast, and it provides um, significant economic and, and cultural value for our communities. It's really important here in Maine. This is the co-op on Islesford, which is Little Cranberry Island. It's the easternmost year-round inhabited unbridged island community in the United States. That's a mouthful, but um, there's 70 people who live out here, and there are 20 fishermen who fish from this co-op. Almost every family on this island is um, directly connected to the lobster fishery. The fishermen who fish from this co-op land almost a little bit more than a million pounds of lobster each year. It's very fair to say that without the lobster fishery um, or without fishing activity, this community would be in trouble. And so at the Island Institute, this is why we care about um, making sure that the lobster fishery is represented in the ocean plan and that people understand how the fishery works and, and operates and what the concerns are. So why should anybody else care about the lobster fishery? It's great that those of us here at the Island Institute care about it, but um, in 2014, the American lobster was the single most valuable species landed in the United States the single most valuable species. It's not the most valuable fishery, um, but it's close. But it's the most valuable species landed. 80% of those landings come from Maine. In, uh, we, Maine issues 6,000 licenses, and when you add in Sternman, there are over 10,000 people involved in the fishery alone. 
in Maine, the DMR issues uh, 3 million trap tags each year, and almost 2 million of those are, we believe, are fished. The best estimate is the fishery has more than 250,000 trips each year, which means that the lobster fishery alone has more trips than any other state on the East Coast, as for all of their fisheries combined. Maine lands 120 million pounds of lobster a year. Lobsters mostly weigh between one pound and a, and a pound and a half. Um, doing some, some simple math, as, as a state, Maine's lobster fishermen handle 80 to 100 million individual lobsters a year. Those animals are alive when they leave the boat, and they're alive all the way through the value chain. Fishermen release 60 to 80 percent of the lobsters they catch alive uh, back into the ocean. And so that means that Maine fishermen are handling roughly 350 million lobsters a year. That's a lot of lobsters. Um, at the same time, fishermen are licensed to fish in one of specific seven, one of seven zones. Um, and you have to fish your gear in, in that zone. Um, and then further getting into the spatial aspects of the fishery, um, many fishermen fish in an area specific to their community. These are informal areas, they're social areas, they don't exist in regulations, but um, people who try to fish outside of their community territory often find that to be very difficult. We've seen a lot of changes in the lobster fishery too. So the lobster fishery in 2014 was the most valuable, or the lo American lobster was the most valuable species landed, you can see the, um, the graph here that shows the value of the fishery. So if you look back at um, 2000 or so, we had a, a value of about $60 million in, in Maine. Um, oh, sorry, value of uh, $250 million. Now we're at $500 million. And you go back a little bit before that, and it was a, a $40, $50, $60 million fishery. Um, We've seen an incredible increase in the number of, in the amount of landings too. We've gone from 30 to 40 million pounds a year to 120 million pounds a year. These are huge changes for Maine and for the lobster fishery. Um, at the same time, when you think about where else in the United States we're catching lobsters, lobsters go from Canada all the way down to um, well into the mid-Atlantic. but for the most part, the landings in uh, south of Cape Cod are much lower um, and have been declining. And in some cases, even uh, fisheries even been shut down. So um, you have this fishery that is community-based. Fishermen are tied to specific places in the ocean where they can fish. It's a large fishery. It's a complex fishery. Um, not that every one of those 6,000 participants in the fishery has a different business model, but there are a variety of different business practices in the fishery. Um, it's been undergoing a lot of change in the last few years. So how do you represent this fishery in the context of what the New England Regional Ocean Plan is doing? Um, how do you provide the information that is important and relevant to the process to help the process incorporate the lobster fishery? So now I'll turn it over to Rebecca to answer, uh, answer these questions. <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, before I jump into um, the report aspect of this presentation, um, I want to ask you all a question. How could this work um, be applied to other fisheries? So as I'm going through our um, design methods and results, just be thinking of how this could be applied to maybe the tuna fishery or another fishery that is not currently represented in the Northeast Regional Ocean Plan. Um, you can type questions, comments, um, start discussions in your little toolbar, toolbar, and we should have plenty of time at the end to go through all of your questions. So we interviewed um, 19 fishermen from each of the seven uh, management zones to get their perspectives on ocean planning. Um, we used a set of questions to start conversations 
and allowed fishermen to fully voice their opinions about changes they've seen over the years, whether it's uh, environmental changes, regulation and man management changes, and how ocean planning may influence the lobster fishery. Um, we then compiled all of the uh, interviews into one document and looked to see the similarities and responses. And it was in really interesting to see um, a lot of similarities that fishermen um, are concerned about. So the first um, big concern is about um, future ocean uses that could restrict how fishermen adopt to changing conditions. So as many of you know, things are changing out there rapidly on the water. Uh, species are shifting, moving. A lot of species that are traditionally found in more southern waters are now being caught off the coast of Maine. Um, fishermen have to adapt really quickly to these changing conditions in order to maintain their business. Um, so just they're very concerned that any future, future ocean use, whether it's offshore wind or aquaculture, um, may not allow for fishermen to quickly adapt to changing conditions. Another concern is um, increased fishing effort. So having new people coming into the uh, fishing industry, as well as shifting effort due to other ocean uses. So Nick mentioned this earlier. It's very difficult for fishermen to um, move to a different fishing territory. Um, so anything that displaces fishermen um, could cause some challenges. Uh, the third piece, um, the value of the fishery extends well beyond the economic um, dollar value. Uh, the historical culture, cultural and social importance of fishing communities cannot be overemphasized. So if fishing were to disappear or get disrupted, um, especially in some of these smaller communities, there's, there's a good chance that these communities may disappear. Um, so considerations for the ocean planning process. Um, definitely need to consider change. Um, things are changing out there very quickly. Uh, fishermen are, f are fishing in different ways that they never thought that they would do a decade before. Um, fishermen are fishing different bottom types. Um, traditionally, lobster are found in kind of hard, rocky cobble bottom. Now fishermen are finding that muddy bottom is the most productive bottom type, which they have never really seen before. So just um, making sure that that is incorporated somehow into the planning process. Um, ocean projects should recognize the place-based nature of the fishery. Um, lobstermen from a particular management zone cannot move to a different management zone, so just um, being aware of that displacement part of the fishery. And also, uh, no surprise, communication is very key. Um, so first, the lobster industry should be engaged um, by specific projects through a variety of techniques, including trade associations and established fishing industry media. Um, this came up a lot in the interviews, um, that fishermen um, rely upon um, the Maine Lobstermen's Association newsletter. Um, that gets a lot of attention and gets read by a lot of fishermen. Um, so just making sure that uh, project pro proponents are aware of those networking pieces and also making sure that developers make an effort to talk to the right fishermen. So making sure that they work with the community and figure out who is best to reach out to, who will be the most helpful to kind of communicate um, different ideas and different projects. Sorry, I'm too fast. <laughs> so I did that really quick. Uh, for more information um, and to get access to the full report, you can click on that first, the top link. Um, the second link is a link to a blog post that we posted a couple of months ago. Um, it just gives a good summary of the report 
and also highlights a community case study, um, which you can check out. Cool. So uh, before we get into questions and, and things like that, um, I did want to acknowledge that um, we had two other authors on the report. We, we worked with two consultants, Sam Belknap, who is on the webinar, and George LaPointe, and this work wouldn't have been possible without either of, of them. So um, a huge thank you to them, and Sam, if uh, you're in a place where you can answer questions and people have questions about the interview process, um, we might put you on the spot. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so please go ahead and send in questions that you have. Um, just type them into the question uh, part of the user interface and uh, uh, Nick and Rebecca would be happy to answer them, I feel certain. Um, so we don't have any right now, uh, but hopefully we'll get some shortly. Um, I did want to ask, uh, like, are there plans to do anything similar uh, with other fisheries anytime soon? So from our perspective, we would love for, for this work to spread to other fisheries. I, I think it's um, the fishermen we worked with and the fisheries managers we talked to and the RPB members we worked with um, all thought it was this process was providing helpful information about the main lobster fishery and so expanding it to lobster, the lobster fish in New England would be a natural um, easy step and then you know in, in digging into some of the other fisheries in New England the tuna fishery um, it would be very helpful to have a report like this for for that fishery um, they have a very different set of issues they're um, they're wide wide-ranging fishery and you know the the tuna are pelagic species up here and they end up the fishermen fishing for them end up all over the Gulf of Maine um, and so it's much less tied to community, but that doesn't mean it's um, not tied to particular parts of the ocean. So um, we don't have any plans at the moment to look at this with other um, fisheries. I, I think one of the things that we're excited about is the ocean plan that's um, the draft ocean plan here in New England because it does identify some of these needs as places for for their work for the RPV. And so we did this project um, looking to inform the RPV and inform um, their discussions and inform the ocean plan and inform how they're looking at fisheries. And the report that we just did on the, the very high level pieces of information that are that are in there is uh, you know, it's 30 30 some odd, 35 pages long, and so um, that's been submitted to the RPB, and and I know um, we've had conversations with RPB members who are um, who would be interested in having similar work for other fisheries because they thought it really helped explain um, the concerns that fishermen had about ocean space and about how space was being used, and really getting at those questions about context and background on the fishery. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Nick. Um, let's see. We do have some questions that come in, too. Um, how is climate change affecting the lobster fishery in Maine? I, I would be happy to have let Sam have a, a crack at that. If, if okay. Let me, uh, let me go unmute Sam. I ho hopefully, Sam, you are ready to be put on the spot. Hey, hey Sam. Sam. Hello. Yeah, hi, we can hear you now, Sam. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Nick, for putting me on the spot, but I suppose okay. it's, uh, it's my duty since I'm doing this on, as part of my dissertation work. Um, I mean, the, the, the lobster fishery has been broadly impacted by climate change in a variety of ways. Um, most noticeably, it's just the expansion of the territory that lobsters are able to inhabit. Um, if you look at the kind of the boom that we've been seeing in down east Maine, a lot of that is tied to improved ocean conditions based on on warming and food availability. Um, and just looking back at the history of the the fishery, uh, we've been traditionally a 30 million pound fishery, except for the last uh, last decade. 
um, when we've been in a 120 million pound fishery. So uh, up to now, at least in the Gulf of Maine, um, climate change, at least in the form of warming waters, has been a good thing uh, for the lobster fishery, um, with the exception of, of 2012, uh, when we had that anom anomalously warm winter and spring, and, and too many lobsters were caught, and, and that caused a pretty significant price depression. And that really impacted lobsters and lobstering communities. Um, but if you look at the, the fisheries outside of the Gulf of Maine, in particular in southern New England, you see a little bit more drastic impact um, where warming coupled with a, a host of other uh, factors have, have really kind of pushed lobsters to their limits um, in terms of, of what they're able to tolerate. And we saw a, a collapse and die off of the Long Island Sound fishery uh, a decade or so ago. Um, so it's, it's a mixed bag of, of climate change impacts right now. Okay. All right, Sam. Uh, we appreciate you stepping in to answer that. So um, we'll move on to the next question. Let's see. Uh, can you discuss how the results of this study were incorporated into the New England Regional Ocean Plan and local MSP efforts? Yeah, that is a great question. So we started this work last fall around this time. Um, we started scoping the project and Sam and George did a bunch of interviews over the course of the winter, and then we spent a better part of the spring um, collecting those and organizing them and, and writing the report, figuring out what the most important things were. Um, we didn't finalize the report until, uh, until July, June, late June. Um, and at that point, the RPB had a draft plan that was out. So um, it wasn't incorporated in the draft plan directly, but um, throughout the process of developing the report and the project, we're working closely with Maine's um, representatives to the regional planning body, and we were working closely with the staff at NROC who were writing the plan and keeping them informed of our outcomes and, and what what we were finding, and so there are pieces in the uh, in chapter three in under the commercial fisheries characterization that um, I think were were tweaked or were informed by this work, um, and we're hoping that the the final plan when it comes out incorporates the this work by by reference. But really, the most important thing is that. Um, the information is available and the context and the background about the lobster industry is available. And so as we look at other uses that are coming into the waters off of the Gulf of Maine, whether it's offshore wind or electric cables or uh, other things, changing other uses that are that are changing where, where they are, the this report provides some background context for anybody who is not familiar with the lobster industry and is going to be engaging with the with the industry. A lot of times we find um, concerns from fishermen that, well, let's say a fisherman will raise a, a concern in a specific process, but it'll be a localized concern. And this report gives um, both the fisherman and also the developer or the regulator the ability to put that concern in a broader context. So it's not just one fisherman saying, you're going to destroy where I fish, or you're going to prevent me from making a living, or if you do that over here, all of those people are going to move into where I fish, and, and that's going to harm my business. It gives a little bit of context and background for how those issues work, and also for just the overall context that the lobster fishery is operating in. OK. All right. Thank you, Nick. Uh, actually, now we have lots of questions. Um, okay, another question that came up, in particular, how are the sociocultural values incorporated and what recommendations would you have for other MSP efforts looking to incorporate sociocultural values? Um, you should do it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think for, for what we have in New England, the connection between community and ocean space and the connection between community values about 
the ocean and what's in the plan is a place that's been identified and recognized as needing further work. So part of the answer is stay tuned for the implementation of the plan. Um, more, more broadly, you know, the, the planning process when you, you go back to, we're going to cruise through some slides here quickly. I think for me this slide says a lot about how you go about incorporating the socioeconomic, cultural, community values um, into a planning process. On one hand, you've got fishermen sitting around a table, talking, interacting with each other, sharing information. Um, this was a two and a half, three hour conversation and then we went to dinner and continued on from there, but it was a a great conversation about where um, where these guys fish for scallops in the mid coast area um, and some of the changes they've been seeing in the environment and some of their concerns about climate change um, and some of their concerns about the future of the community. On the other side, you have VMS data, which is an excellent data source, but it's very disconnected from the people. And when fishermen who fish in, say, Portland or Harpswell um, or the Midcoast, which is getting up towards the top of the slide, looked at the VMS data, they didn't see themselves in the data. They didn't see that they were represented. They didn't see that they were um, acknowledged as being important, in part because they weren't fishing full-time for ground fish. They would fish for ground fish part of the year, fish for lobster part of the year, go tuna fishing, go shrimping, go scalloping do a whole bunch of things and if your data set is just those vessels and, and those times where people are fishing for ground fish, you miss the, the human connection. Um, so, you know, it's the VMS data is incredibly helpful for some things. It's not particularly helpful for other things. The Mid-Atlantic process is doing some really interesting work with vessel trip reports and tying that back to community. Um, so I, there are a couple of different ways of going about doing it, but it fundamentally comes back to you're talking about individual, at least with fishermen, it comes back to you're talking about individual fishing businesses that operate in a specific location in a specific spatial area um, and have to respond to a whole bunch of complex management and environmental interactions. And so when you look at the broad region-wide VMS maps, it doesn't tell you that. It doesn't tell you that story. Um, and so the more you can incorporate that story and the people into the process, the closer you get to incorporating socio and cultural values. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Um, another question. Uh, how do you go about protecting lobster fishing habitat if habitat used by lobsters is changing? Okay. Uh, that, that is a good question. I would say right now um, some habitat, and Sam, feel free to jump in here um, or anybody else on the, uh, if anybody else is a, a lobster expert, feel free to uh, flag, your, flag for us. But, you know, the, the changes in the fishery, there are still parts of the bottom that are particularly important for lobsters life cycles and there are parts of the bottom that are less important. And so we've seen the expansion um, in the offshore fishery, the fishery out in the, you know, 10 to 30, 40 miles offshore go from being on the cobble bottom, on the gravel bottom, on the rocky bottom to being on the mud bottom. And so the mud bottom isn't particularly important for lobsters long-term sustainability. It's important right now, but um, the fishery was sustainable at 30, 40, 50 million pounds when the lobsters weren't there. Now that they're there, it still might be important for important habitat, but it's not as important habitat as, as other parts are. Um, and then there are various life stages where lobsters are more or less vulnerable to um, predation or to habitat impacts. And so um, 
some of it's about making sure that the inshore habitat where lobsters settle out is um, is protected. And but yeah, Sam, if you've got anything to add on there, feel free. No, Nick, I think you did a, a great job of of characterizing that. It's uh, it's just because the lobsters are using the mud, mud, mud bottom now doesn't mean it's important habitat. Um, like you said, it's that, that cobble bottom that's traditionally been the important habitat. They're just expanding so much they're using more and di diverse types of habitat right now. And it's, it's worth noting that the lobster fishery is uh, MSC certified. It's a sustainable fishery. We're not overfishing despite um, the huge increase in, in landings. It's one of the more sustainable fisheries around, and some of the conservation practices in the fishery have been in place for 150 years or more, um, including throwing over egg-bearing females and lobsters that are too small and lobsters that are too big. Okay. All right. Thank you, Nick and Sam. Um, all right. I have one more question, so if anybody else has an additional question, please go ahead and send it now. Let's see. Uh, Okay, yeah, we're already getting some. Uh, okay, I like the idea of the community territory, in quotations, because this already applies to marine spatial planning. Has anyone discussed this option with the other fisheries to see if this can be applied to other fisheries within the New England region? This way, multiple stakeholders can contribute to the plan as, as well through a similar process. I think that's where we'd love for the plan to go, um, but that goes back to the fact that this isn't a spatial plan and it's more about information to make better decisions. So the way that at least we see this working is the plan provides a bunch of information that says, hey, there may be some ground fishing activity here, there may be somebody, some scallop fishing activity here, there may be some lobstering activity here. Um, that triggers, then triggers a need for further conversations from either federal agencies or uh, project proponents, depending on, on what we're talking about. And the process for having those conversations has not been defined in the plan, but um, is, I think, one of the next big pieces of work that the planning body is going to be tackling. Um, there are some great examples in Maine in the last year where hydrographic survey work. NOAA has been doing some hydrographic surveys in Penobscot Bay and um, there's some great examples of reaching out to the fishermen who might be impacted by that work, understanding their concerns, understanding how to communicate with them, um, and just doing a really good job of that. And that's in you know comparison to a couple of years ago, there was some hydrographic survey work where that didn't happen and the communication was poor and it caused a lot of conflict and tension. And so it, it really is, this is the entry point or the starting point for a conversation with people, um, with the impacted fishermen about their businesses. And I think, you know, to the, to the point that it's not just lobster, most of these fishermen don't view themselves as a lobsterman or a ground fish fisherman. They're, they view themselves as fishermen and they do a bunch of different things. So looking at the fisherman in, in the in the picture, the guy with the hat on that's got his back to us, you know, he lobsters, he scallops, he um, has gone ground fishing in the past, he's gotten shrimping in the past when we've had shrimp seasons. Um, so it's a whole bunch of things. And he's he's a, a fisherman and that's how he relates to the water. And so it's figuring out who are those community leaders who will um, be able to tell you, yes, this is problematic for these reasons, or it's not problematic for most people, but it's going to be a problem for this subset of our community. Um, getting to those people is really important, and the plan doesn't yet have a great mechanism for doing that, but I think it's being developed, it's in, in the process of development, and perhaps more importantly, the state agency staff who are sitting on the RPB, they know how to do this. These are the people that they interact with on a daily basis in fisheries management and, and fisheries regulation in Maine. So they know who, who to call, and so it's about making sure that federal agencies know at least I should reach out to DMR and say, we're thinking about doing something. What do you know? Who do you know? And they'll rattle off a list of 10 people that are give you a pretty good sense of um, what's happening in a particular area. 
I don't know okay. if that yeah. exactly answers the question, but. Okay, no, I think that was very helpful, Nick. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Another question. Um, how have the increased landing since the 1990s changed coastal communities? Well, we have, uh, so in 1995 in Maine, we landed about, um, I'm just going to see if, I can, if we have this in here. Uh, we don't have it in here. We, we landed about um, 28 million pounds of ground fish, 30, 32 million pounds of urchins, 10 million pounds of shrimp, um, and about 30, eight million pounds of lobster. Um, 2015, as a state, we landed uh, about 2.8 million pounds of ground fish, landed, you know, less than, you know, about 1.2 million pounds of urchins, 800,000 pounds of scallops, shrimp season's been closed for three years, um, but we landed 120 million pounds of lobster. So some of the economic benefit uh, in growth in the lobster fishery and in, in the lobster landings um, has displaced the loss of other fisheries. Um, some of it is it's going back into the communities, but bait's more expensive, fuel's more expensive, and the lobster prices are about the same as they were in 1995. We're still getting three, four dollars a pound for, for our lobsters. So even though we're catching a higher, higher volume um, with increased costs and um, not an increase in price, the fishery is not as profitable as it would appear by the, by the graphs. That's not to say that people aren't doing well in the last couple of years, that people haven't been doing well, but um, it's not as big a change as some of the graphs and, and information would, would lead you to believe. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Nick. Uh, and that's our last question that we have. This is a great Q&A uh, after a very interesting presentation. So thank you to everyone who was able to attend, and a very special thank you to Nick and Sam uh, for all the insights and sharing. Um, their their mapping project with us. Um, so uh, if anyone is interested uh, in future webinars, we uh, encourage you to sign up uh, for them through the EBM Tools Network or openchannels.org. And we look forward to seeing you on, on future webinars. And, and thank you again to Nick and Rebecca and Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.